Published in 1996, a small hardcover book with a white dust jacket transported readers to a small island where the survivors of a plane crash landed. The plane was the Lockheed Electra, and the survivors were Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. A tale of what if the lyrical prose captured the attention of critics and readers alike, drawing them into the magical reality of sunshine shores and passion. Jane Mendelssohn followed I Was Amelia Earhart with her second book, Innocence, a coming of age story set in Upper West Side, Manhattan. Dark and sinister plots converge, suicide packs and a wicked stepmother drive this gothic and lush tale. Tonight, Jane is here to talk about American music, a novel which once again transports us to places that are shockingly real, but mysterious and otherworldly. Honor is the 21-year-old physical therapist at a Bronx Veterans Administration Hospital, and Milo Hatch is a particularly traumatized patient who was severely wounded in Iraq. During Milo's treatment, both he and Honor begin having visions of people they don't know. The search for the meaning of these visions and Mendelssohn's prose transports us back to the 1930s in the jazz age and to far off places, both real and imagined. Jane is a graduate of Yale University and her writing and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the New York Times Book Review, the London Review of Books, The Guardian, The New Republic, The Village Voice, The Yale Review, and many others. She is married and lives in New York with her husband and two children and she is here tonight to dazzle us with, once again, her third novel. Will you please welcome Jane Mendelssohn. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you for being readers and book lovers. Um, so American Music is my third novel. Uh, it's been 10 years since I published a book, so this is very exciting to me to be on tour again. Um, this book took a long time in the making, obviously. And I thought before I read from it, I would talk a little bit about its origins or the things that inspired me to write it. The first kind of nugget of inspiration came actually when I was on my book tour for I Was Amelia Earhart. And one of my stops, I stayed with a writer and her husband. And he was talking to me about his family's business and told me that they made symbols, this kind of symbols, the instruments. And he mentioned that it was a family business going back centuries, and that there was a secret formula for making symbols that had stayed secret in the family for all those generations. And that just kind of sparked my thinking and got me going. And uh, when I got back home, I started researching, and I discovered that it, it was in 1623 and 17th century Istanbul that an Armenian alchemist, the Sultan's alchemist, um, was trying to perfect his formula for making symbols and came up with the recipe. And, it, and when I say formula, I mean, mean the, the combination of the alloys, how long they were heated, tempered, banged on the whole process and to make a particular sound, a very brilliant, shining sound. And I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's a story. So one of the original ideas for this book came from that, and I ended up weaving my own tale around that. But as I was researching the family, I also discovered that, well, they came to America at one point, and they were very connected to the jazz community because the jazz musicians needed cymbals for their drum sets. And I learned that um, a big moment in jazz history was when the beat started, it, it was originally kept by the drums, but once they started keeping the beat with the cymbals, that was a pivotal moment in swing music, in the creation of swing music. And I thought to myself, how cool and fascinating that this quintessential American form of music, and with swing being kind of the, you know, so American, actually had its origins all the way in 17th century Turkey. And that kind of amazed me, just those connections. At the same time, I was researching another idea, which came from um, a friend of mine who does body work. And she told me about a patient she had a man who, she didn't work with him for that long, but he would never lie on his back. 
We only lie on his front. And I thought, what secret did he have? What was that about? So again, my imagination went spinning off. And I had started thinking about a character who had this uh, secret and what it would be, and he became a soldier in my mind as I thought about that. And this was a long time ago. This was, you know, around, oh, the late 90s into 2000, I was researching. I was living in New York City, I still live in New York City. And so I was researching kind of Islamic culture, I was thinking about a soldier, and then came 9-11. And it was very strange and uncanny and kind of uncomfortable that I had been thinking about those things and that they were in my book and I had started weaving them together. So I actually put the book aside for a while. It was always percolating in my mind, but I didn't write it for a little while. And when I came back to it, a lot had spun together, had woven together, and I had a very clear idea of my soldier character and a very clear idea of this kind of myth of origins of symbols and a lot of ideas for how to weave them together, but then it took me a long time more to connect the two. But eventually the story is kind of, I like to think of it as they almost met each other and fell in love and they connected. And the book is almost like a puzzle. Um, someone has said it's sort of secretly connected love stories that um, go from this story in the present of Milo, this Iraq war veteran who's in the hospital and honor the woman who's working with him. Um, that's connected all the way back to the 17th century. In the middle, kind of the emotional center of the book is a story that takes place in the 30s during the swing era in New York City. And that's where um, the, the central love story of the book takes place there. Uh, there are other pieces from different decades that came together to make the book. Um, but I won't say anything more about those. I'll answer any questions after. But I think if that situates people enough, I can start reading from the book. I'm going to read right from the first chapter, right from the beginning. The book, um, the book shifts back and forth uh, among all these different stories. It's not a linear narrative. And somebody actually asked me earlier today when I was doing something for radio, you know, why that is. And I think. There's a lot of reasons, but I think one of them, I mean, uh, I didn't want it to be, I wanted to keep the mystery of how the stories were connected for a while. I wanted it to be about the emotional connection between these two characters and then all these other characters and the layers of that that unfold, sort of unfold the way the stories unfold. And then also, the book is circular. There's a circular way that it's told that kind of echoes, if you will, the shape of the symbol. And the symbols are, and the sound of symbols is a theme that runs through the whole book. It's kind of the thread of the book, the background music of the book, and it's kind of the connective tissue between all the stories. So right from the get-go, it shifts back and forth. Chapter 1, 2005. She stands up in the subway car where she has been sitting and looks out into the darkness. Her stop is coming, and she likes the moment before the light breaks through the window. There is her reflection in the glass, a ghost with a shifting skeleton and a visible heartbeat as the columns and dim lights that make up the architecture of this underworld scroll through her body rapid fire in the blackness. Then she disappears into the light. She turns toward the doors. She adjusts the strap of the bag slung across her chest and quickly steps onto the platform. It is raining softly when she emerges onto the street. From a distance, she appears to be marching silently through the mist. With her steady gaze and long coat, her faded satchel and heavy boots, she appears both present and ancient. She looks like some beautiful soldier arrived from history. She walks several blocks along empty gray streets toward a large, white, undistinguished building. In the lobby of the building, she shows an identification card and rides up in the elevator. She steps off and walks down a hall. A door is open for her. Inside, a man is lying chest down on a table, a thin white sheet covering his body. His hand lifts slightly when she enters. You're here, she says. I'm here, he says. That's something, she says. It is. 
Every week she pulls down the sheet and studies his back. She washes her hands and oils them and then rubs the oil onto the skin. His hands clench when she starts to work. He seems to be experiencing something more than pain. As she touches him, there is transmitted to her bones his fierce desire to remain separate. He is determined not to reveal his secrets. She has visited him for weeks and she knows his back by now. The flat plane between the shoulder blades, the slope down to the sacrum. But she knows only his back, his neck, his arms, his legs. He will only lie on his front. He will never lie on his back. Never let her work on his face or chest. He will not tell her why. She knows only that he has seen more than he can share, and she was told during the interview that she would have to respect his privacy. These men are suffering, the nurse had cautioned her. These men are haunted. Still, there were stories in his body that she searched for like a detective. She had begun to feel as though she could read him, as if she could interpret the meaning in his knots and sinews. Sometimes, and this was not the first time she had questioned her sanity, she received visions from his limbs, his muscles, his bones. The first time it had happened, she was touching his ankle when there arose in her mind the image of a woman standing underwater in a shaft of light, her dark hair wafting weightlessly like ink. Then her hand reached his neck and she saw more people. At first, they appeared to be moving to music, glittering couples swaying on a dance floor. But then in a shift of perspective, she saw hundreds of bodies, each alone, swaying upright underwater. An underwater graveyard with thousands of unseeing eyes staring directly at her. Suddenly, she felt sick. The light changed outside, the sky grew darker, and in the small, dim room, the body on the table seemed to break beneath her touch. Then, from inside that, as if it were a hollowed out, broken sculpture, came pouring waves of water. She placed her hands on the man's back until she could not see the swaying bodies any longer. She took a breath. For the moment, there were no more visions. She was safe. Yet within him, she knew, were only more stories. For a soldier's body is a work of art that contains his country's history. You were saying something in your sleep, she said. No, he said. Yes, you were trying to tell me something. He whispered something inaudible, then nothing. She had her hand on his arm, and in a sudden flash, she saw a pair of cymbals made of burnished, beaten metal. She thought she could hear the reverberations of their clanging, as if from a great distance. Then she looked down at his face and saw the rapid, uncontrollable movement of his eyelids. He was sleeping, but he was not at peace. He began to speak again. This time it was clear, and she could make out most of the words. He described an elaborate ballroom and dancing with his hand pressed firmly against a woman's back. He talked about someone who disappeared. For years, I looked for her in the jungle, in the desert. I saw her face on the body of a tiger. He opened his eyes, but he was still sleeping. She looked into those eyes, and they were shining, metallic. What was he trying to tell her? We died that night at Roseland. He said they fell in love because of the music. Count Basie was making his New York debut on Christmas Eve at the Roseland Ballroom. The count and the reflections of the count on the instruments swayed slightly when he lifted his arm. He turned in time to the beat, and his image danced along the line of brass, so that although he was gracefully and confidently conducting his orchestra, he appeared to be imprisoned inside the music. He took a seat at the piano. He nodded his head. The music swung. The bodies on the dance floor moved like thoughts in one consciousness, bubbles in a glass of champagne. He said he put his hand on a woman's back. He pulled her close. When they danced, they danced slow, and that's when he knew that the music would kill them both. On the dance floor, there were hundreds of us, swaying upright like moving tombstones. Is this a dream, she asked. No, he said. When did it happen? 1936. 1936. Joe lifted his black saxophone case with one hand, and with the other, he picked up his brown leather suitcase. He used his arm to push his hat a little bit back on his head. He watched the city coming toward him. Over the railing the water, in the water, the reflection of the skyline slid closer with its gray syringe buildings shooting straight ahead, like a metal tray of instruments being handed to a doctor. He would not have known what to do with them. He was a musician. 
The boat pulled in lazily to the harbor, and the air tasted like salt and dirt and real silver. Across the green expanse of river, he saw a milling crowd. In that instant, he lived peacefully with the certain knowledge that he would be met with an embrace. His wife would be there. He couldn't help smiling. Someone's happy to be home, a stranger said to him. Welcome to New York City, Joe said. The sun was strong, although shrouded now and then by clouds, and he was hot in his best suit. When the ship finally pulled in, he saw the cumulus blow away to reveal a powder blue sky. The heat surged, causing the passengers on the deck to shift uncomfortably and then remove various items, gloves, scarves. Everyone was overdressed. By the time the liner docked, most people were disheveled and in the excitement of arrival had overcome their usual propriety. Strangers spoke to strangers. Those who had become friends during the crossing bade farewell, exchanged addresses, shed tears. It was as if the assembled had gathered for a wedding or a funeral on this sunny morning in September. He closed his eyes and let a last gasp of ocean air hit his face. The dock was shadowed by the great ship and crowded. A watery light filtered down from on high and seemed to float between the bodies. He moved with a steady grace through the throng. He passed a woman standing amidst 12 pieces of well-traveled luggage. She recognized him from her time at the captain's table, and as he walked by, she grabbed hold of his arm to tell him how much she had enjoyed him, his playing. He had hardly time to thank her. He was moving so quickly, searching the faces. A flash of anger pierced his thoughts when he considered that Pearl might not be there, but then he reconsidered. He stepped beyond the center of the crowd into the brightness where he saw a man holding a birdcage. When the man bent down to get something, the space behind him revealed a gray hat with a white feather. It was her best hat. Pearl did not see him. She was looking just to the left of him, beyond him, and she was beautiful. She was beautiful in a simple, lovely way that he knew like he knew a song. Her eyes were squinting a little, and she held a small piece of paper in her small hand, and standing next to her and clearly with her was someone he didn't know, a woman. The woman was looking also at the crowd or passed it, and seemed to be saying something to Pearl. In all likelihood, she was asking her what he looked like, but the expression on the woman's face was so calm and unquestioning that she might have been talking about something completely unrelated. It was as though she was not aware of the movement around her, or if she was, it did not concern her. She seemed to occupy her own air. She was taller than Pearl. She was wearing sunglasses. As he approached and Pearl saw him, her lipstick lips burst apart and she rushed toward him and held him and the person next to her stood still in her own atmosphere. Only after he and Pearl had kissed and he had stroked her temples and eyelids with his thumb and she had clasped her hand on the back of his neck and they had said hello with their eyes, did the air open up around the other person enough for him to actually look at her face. That's when he observed the curve of her cheek like a dangerous road and the elegant line of her mouth. In each of the lenses of her round sunglasses floated a tiny, perfect ship. Still, he could not quite look at her. 2005. The hospital was the oldest veterans hospital in New York. It stood atop a hill on the highest point in the city, a spot that had been a strategic vantage point during the Revolutionary War. In 1847, the millionaire William Bailey, later of Barnum and Bailey Circus, had built an estate on this location for his bride. In 1922, the Veterans Bureau had bought the land and set up a hospital for veterans suffering from mental and nervous disorders. In 1970, Life magazine had run a feature on the hospital exposing its deplorable conditions. Paralyzed vets lay on one side for 10 hours without being moved or washed. Without enough attendants to empty them, the urine bags to which the men were hooked up spilled over onto the floor. When and if they were given a shower, the men could wait helplessly for hours to be dried. And often they were put back into bed on the same sweaty sheets. There were rats. A paralyzed veteran might suddenly awaken to find a rat on his hand. He could not move his hand, so he would try to jerk his shoulders. He screamed, and the rat jumped casually off the bed. In the paraplegic ward, a completely crippled patient would depend on a buddy who still had the use of his arms to get a sheet thrown sailing and rippling and falling like a shroud over his bed. As a result of the Life magazine expose, the hospital was overhauled and conditions were vastly improved. 
more than 30 years later, those who were aware enough of their circumstances to appreciate them, or the families of those who weren't, felt lucky to be living or have their loved ones living in this hospital and not in a bad hospital and not out on the streets. The ever-increasing number of homeless veterans was a decades-old national tragedy. During the day, they lingered in the parks and on the sidewalks. They sat beside signs, scrolled on cardboard boxes, in which had been shipped computers and flat-screen televisions and imported foods and kitchen appliances. The faces of the soldiers looked stricken and lined, and their eyes blinked in the rays of sunlight that beat down on them like the unstoppable force in civilian life of their own private wars. The woman was also happy to be working in the hospital and not to be out on the streets. She was nearly alone in this world. Her name was Honor. Her soldier's name was Milo. And I'll stop there if there are questions. I'm happy to answer them. I'm also happy to read more if people would like. <laughs> but, um, but I find that usually that's a good stopping place and people have a lot of questions. So if you do, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, and more than, yes? Oh, if people ask the question, repeat it? Sure. Any questions? I had a book launch and signing at a bookstore in Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Dumbo. It's called the Powerhouse Arena Bookstore. And it's, um, it's a wonderful bookstore, which was originally a theater, so there was a great space for people to sit in and watch the reading and listen. And the... Um, the owner of the store, the, the owner and her husband also publish art and photography books. And she had read the book a few days before, and before she came out to introduce me, she arrived with this handful of art books, all by the photographer Helen Levitt, whom she had published. There is a photographer later in this book, um, very important character. Uh, her story mainly takes place in the 60s and later. And I hadn't mentioned to anybody anything about this character. And she came up to me and said, I read your book, I loved it, and I know exactly who this photographer is, it's Helen Levitt. And I said, well, it's not. It's inspired by her, not, it's not her, it's not based on her. There's a whole history to the character that has nothing to do with the photographer Helen Levitt. Um, do people know who the photographer Helen Levitt is? She, was, uh, she died in 2009. She lived a very quiet life. She started taking pictures in the 30s and 40s. You would probably know her images. They are largely of children on the streets of New York. She took a lot of them in Spanish Harlem. She was born in Brooklyn, and she worked with um, Walker Evans and James Agee. They were friends, and she was really kind of the, the Cartier-Bresson of America. She was a really great photographer. And the reason that the photographer in this book was inspired by her is an interesting story, and that was what was so funny about the reading, was that I hadn't mentioned this to anybody, but she showed up with all these books and said, I knew you were writing about her because of the way you described where she lived and that she took photographs of children. Now, the reason I had a description of where she lived was because for many years I lived on East 12th Street in Manhattan, and there was a woman on the block. I lived in a walk-up, like a classic Greenwich Village, brownstone walk up. And there was a woman who lived on the top floor on that block. Um, so a fifth floor walk up, very steep stairs. And she must have been in her 80s. And I always noticed her. She was a tough, unpretentious, kind of uh, real New Yorker. And it, in the New Yorker that, that I knew from the 70s, the kind of New Yorker I had known growing up, and I was, she always struck me. I had no idea who she was, but she always lived in my mind as this kind of iconic figure. So after I moved out of that, I, I didn't move far away, but I moved from that block. Um, a couple of years later, I was talking to the landlord of the building I had lived in. She said, do you know who that was on that top floor? And she said, Helen Levitt. And I had no idea. And I had been writing a book with a photographer in it. But there were certain details from her life at that point that I did introduce into the book. Um, so that was a very interesting book signing experience. Very interesting. The only person who knew 
that I had thought about her at all for the book was my husband, and he was just dumbstruck when she showed up with all these books. She, she was really a great artist, and she wrote, um, I mean, she didn't write. She was only a photographer, and she, not only, I mean, she just didn't write anything, but she had a great, um, two really wonderful pieces had been written about her that once I knew who she had been, I looked up. One was an introduction to a book called Ways of Seeing, which is an incredible collection of her photographs. I have an amazing, amazing collection of photographs. And it was written by James Agee. And he, it's beautiful, it's just a few pages long. But there was one line in it that really moved me, and he was talking about the surrealism of her work. It's very realistic, it's all these completely naturalistic photographs of street scenes. But she captures this theatricality, and he says this kind of surrealism of metropolitan life. And he uses a phrase, he says, what we call fantasy is instead reality in its unmasked vigor and grace. And I really responded to that. I feel like that's really what I responded to her in her work. And when people ask me about this book, obviously there are these kind of magical, fantastical elements, even from the little bit that I read. This woman, Honor, is getting these stories from this man's body, but um, I don't really think of it as that fantastical. I mean, it is, but it's meant to really make manifest their emotional connection and something that is kind of very real, but hard to talk about in a realistic way. Oh, and Adam Gopnik, had, uh, the New Yorker writer, had done a piece on her and in, in, I think, 2001. And I don't think I had read it when it came out, but I read it later after I knew that, and he talked about walking up to her, up still, you know, that she was still, you know, walking to this really steep flight of stairs, and that she was just a very tough cookie. And... Um, she took so many pictures of children, and he said that she said, you know, people think I love children, but I don't. Not any more than anybody else does. It's just they were the people who were out in the streets. And um, I thought a lot about that, and I thought, well, that might be true, but she took an awful lot of pictures of children. And so maybe in my book, I extrapolated from that and created a character not based on her, who has a complicated relationship to children who does take photographs of children has a more has a complicated and I think I was intrigued by that remark of hers, but the character in the book is not based on her. And are you a musician? I'm not a musician. My grandfather, all these little strands that come in to make a book, was a saxophone player who um, worked his way through law school playing on ships, on transatlantic crossings. So the, when I started being interested in swing in that era, he came to mind. So um, there were a lot of things I had to research. I'm not a musician. I'm not a photographer. I'm not a masseuse. I'm not <laughs> a soldier. Um, I, you know, none of those things. It's all imagination. You know, it's all the, the process. But there was, and there was a lot of research, and I did do. I loved the research. I loved looking at old pictures of Roseland from the 30s. I loved, there's a section fairly early on in the book that takes place. Um, well, first of all, there are sections in the book, there are lots of lots of stories that I said all connect, and they take place in almost every decade of the 20th century. And I think I was trying to say something about how this whole century, when I say that line that I read, a soldier's body is a work of art that contains his country's history, I was trying to get at a lot of things, one of which was that all these events are what led up to this soldier in this place in this time. Um, all kinds of things going back centuries, and particularly in the 20th century, and I tried to make a connection because I think there can be such a disconnect sometimes between what's going on at home when there's a war going on far away. And so I was trying to make some kind of connection that, that I could honestly make since I'm not a war journalist or a soldier or close to it, but just something about the trying to make those connections. Um, so getting, I, one of the things that was really fun to research is there's a section in the book, I, I read about the characters Joe and Pearl just a little bit. 
And shortly after that in the book, there's a, the section where they first meet. And they first meet in 1923. And they meet in California on a film set that was very fun for me to research. It was the set for uh, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. And so that gives a little something away, because when you first start reading that part, you don't know that that's where it's set. But so be it. Um, that was very fun, and I, the, and I got that idea. People, I, I was reading an old Smithsonian magazine, and they were talking about an archaeological dig. I thought, oh, an archaeological dig. And what they were digging for in the California desert were, was the set that had been buried, the set of this movie. So I thought, how, how funny and interesting that they were digging, and they were calling it an archaeological dig, and what they were digging for was the fake... Of things that had been replicated for this, you know, this, they were digging for the set. They weren't digging for the, you know, Arch of Ramses the Third or whatever it was. They were digging for the fake thing that had been made. So um, I thought that was hilarious. And uh, I set their meeting time on that. So she's, she's working as a wardrobe girl, and he's a musician who's been hired to play by Cecil B. DeMille for the... Um, well, I won't give it all away, but he's, he's been brought in. There were musicians who were brought in um, to play music for one part of the filming. You know, I, yes, I mean, from my first book, I Was Amelia Earhart, the snippet for that came from reading an article in the New York Times that mentioned that somebody thought he had found a piece of her plane, which I think actually an article like that is written every few years. But to me, it was news at the time. I had not been an Amelia Earhart buff, but the article mentioned that she'd had a navigator. Um, and I didn't know that. By the way, my, my book was not the basis of the film that came out <laughs> recently. My book is really a fantasy about what happened to her um, after the plane crashed. But that got my imagination going because I didn't know, in you know, my kind of elementary school knowledge of Amelia Earhart, they had never mentioned that there had been a navigator. I thought she'd been alone. So that immediately got me thinking about a relationship and what might have happened. And I think all my books do come from ideas like that, but also I, they tend to be ideas that I think give me the opportunity to think about storytelling. So about the actual and the imagined and how they intersect. What kind of things do I read? I read a lot of different things, so that's always a hard question for me to answer, but I think my right, I don't know how I would characterize my writing style, really. I mean, I love, you know, I love the Hemingway, Faulkner, Fitzgerald greats of that type. I love Henry James. I love Flaubert. I love it all. But um, I like Garcia Marquez very much. I, I think maybe if I were to have to talk about maybe some writers that influenced this book that were in my head might be um, Garcia Marquez, Andaji. Michael Andaji, um, Alice Munro, uh, those are three living writers whose work I admire a lot. I love J.M. Coetzee. Um, you know, I have two small children, and I write whenever I can. I write, well, I wrote a lot of this when they were asleep. I, I, I would say to some people, and it's really true, I learned a lot of this book in my head while I was pushing the swings in Washington Square Park, because I just had to think it through. I do a lot of thinking before I piece it all together. So there was a lot of thinking, and then the sitting down to write it uh, usually happened at night after they went to sleep. A favorite cookbook. Well, I do have a favorite. Who? I have two favorite cookbooks. Do, did who ask that? Oh, you do? I do. I have two favorite cookbooks. Um, the name of one is escaping me right now. It's the Alice Waters Art of Simple F Cooking or Art of Simple Food. It's, I think, Alice Waters' most recent cookbook. Is it the yellow one? Yes. The red one? Yes. That's the one. <laughs> Love that cookbook. <laughs> Love it. It's fantastic. It's so simple. It's just, uh, and, um, and I love the Martella Hazan classics of Italian cooking. I like the minestrone recipe. I've made my own adjustments to it over the years. I don't always put in the white beans. 
but <laughs> but um, but I love that book. Well, Milo from the Greek has something to do with with his soldier, and I think maybe it's the root same for military. Milo, I don't know that for a fact, but it came from that. I wanted kind of he's sort of an archetypal soldier. Um, honor. Well, I like names that are nouns. I have a fondness for noun names. Um, and so there was that, and there was the idea of, I just felt like she had a kind of quiet dignity to her. Um, and that there was a sort of healing going on that had something to do with the idea of honor. So they were both completely meaningful choices. Um, my grandfather, who was the saxophone player, was named Joe. So that's why I named that character Joe. Very simple. <laughs> uh, and Pearl, again, I like that noun kind of name. And she has these layers that develop over time, like a pearl. And uh, and then Vivian, I guess she has a lot of life in her, and Vivian from, you know, Viva. So those were the choices. Though There's a lot of other characters, too, whose names are also significant. What a good question. Um, I think the perk, I'll start with the perk, um, is that to be a writer, you spend a lot of time alone. But New York is a city where you walk out the door and there's all these people. I mean, I don't live in New York for that reason. I live in New York because I'm born and raised in New York. My parents are still in New York. My husband is from New York. He's essentially the boy next door. So for me, New York is a small town. Um, I mean, my husband and I, it turns out, we're del we found this out after we were married. We were delivered by the same obstetrician. <laughs> so we might as well be from like a tiny village somewhere. But we are New Yorkers through and through. So, but that being said, I think an advantage as a writer is on the one hand, you could say there's all this distraction, but on the other hand, to balance out the loneliness that you can experience being by yourself, um, there's a very active world out there. And for me, you know, even raising my two small kids that I could walk to the playground, see people, have a different mix in the neighborhood every day. You know, I think the, the variety of people, it's very inspiring. There's a lot of texture, and so all those are perks. The challenges, I would say, uh, the stress of the pace of life can be, I mean, I think it's just a challenge for anyone who lives there, whether or not you're a writer. I think the noise of the everyday, what's new, what's now, what's current, is not, um, it's something that I tune out. But I think because I grew up there, it's easier for me. So I'm not so caught up in whatever the latest thing is. I think I have, in general, my personality is such that I have a sense of time, is that I'm not that caught up in the moment or whatever is the thing of the moment. But that's pretty noisy in New York. So, and I don't think that's so helpful if you're trying to at least write the kind of books that I'm interested in. So. Um, those would be, and the expense. It's an expensive place to live. You know, I have some very dear friends, and especially my husband. Uh, those are the people I show my work to. I haven't ever been a part of a writing group. I've had a few invitations. And I think for me and the way my process works, I actually, I, everybody's different. Every writer's different. I know a lot of writers who would completely thrive in that situation. Um, I've also never sold a book of mine until it was completely finished. So I'm not, um, you know, my process is unpredictable, erratic, and sort of self-motivated in the middle of the night. So it it's not something that I grab it. In fact, I, um, I got into the Columbia MFA program right after I finished college, and I registered, and then I turned around and got to the end of the line and unregistered, because I just thought it wasn't, um, it wasn't a good fit for me. 
the way I work and I wanted to start doing, you know, get a job. But I think that, and I worked at the Village Voice for the Village Voice Literary Supplement and they let me start writing book reviews so that worked out really great. But I've always had people I do show my work to so I think having that is wonderful. And now that I've been in New York as a writer so many years, I have some very dear friends who are writers and I respect their opinion a lot so I do show them things. In my acknowledgments, I mention a few of my early readers, and they are not all professional writers, but about half of them are. Really young, really young. When I was very young, I announced, according to my parents, that I was going to write children's books. Um, and then I started writing. I wrote a lot when I was maybe 9, 10, 11, 12. I would write these. I read a lot of Agatha Christie's. And I would write these Agatha Christie. I would start to write these mysteries, but I I would have no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> so I have a lot of these unfinished Agatha Christie esque mysteries where people are bursting through the French doors, and I didn't even know I don't think what the French doors were. And I would write lists of names of of detectives and heroines, and I had these notebooks filled with names. So I always loved writing, but it took quite a while to, um, to, to figure it out. And then I, and then I became really, um, I fell in love with poetry in high school. And so that was my original way into writing, really, as a writer. And I wrote poetry in college, and that's what I really studied in college. I mean, sort of poetry and Shakespeare and Spencer and things like that. And, um, and the writing classes I took in college were all poetry. Um, and it wasn't actually until a couple of years after college when I read this article about Amelia Earhart and I had this thought, well, this isn't really a poem, this idea that's percolating in my mind. This is longer than a poem. This is actually prose. I don't know if I would go so far to even call that book a novel. It's very short and it's written in a very um, poem-like way. Uh, so it was really only then that I started deeply grappling with what it meant to write fiction. I'd always read tons of fiction, but that's when I started really. So you could say yes when I was really young, but then I don't think I engaged with it in a very, very serious way until my 20s. Do you have a favorite? A favorite writer of all time? I don't know that I have one favorite of all time. I'm quite fond of Virginia Woolf, uh, but I would not say she's my one favorite of all time. Um, it would be so hard to pick. It would be so, so hard. But I, I um, there are so many. It's a really tough question. Yes? Is there an author that you would love to meet? You know, I have a funny story about that which is that when I was very involved in writing poetry starting in high school, my favorite, he probably still is my favorite contemporary poet, is John Ashbery. I don't know if anybody here knows his writing, but he's, he's a great poet. He's from the New York School, and he, um, he's an amazing, uh, he sort of has a surrealist element to his work too, but he's just, he wrote Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror and Houseboat Days and a lot of great books of poetry. And when I was at working for the Village Voice, I was able to write book reviews. And a book of his came out, and I wrote a piece. And it was kind of an overview of his work. It wasn't just about that book. <coughs> sort of, it was, it was about all of his work. And he was my idol. And I got a letter from him, which was just incredible, saying, you know, I don't recall being touched by criticism of my work as much as yours. And he said we should get together and meet, and I was just beside myself. I was so happy. And so we got together, and um, he's a great poet. He's a great poet. But we got together, and in addition to my being completely tongue-tied when I met him and we had lunch, having absolutely nothing interesting on my part to provide the conversation because I was so awestruck, he also spent a good deal of time talking about his health problems and his recent, he'd had some very serious health problems. So it was, it was like a horrible experience and a fantastic one because it was like, oh, this is a real writer. He 
you know, I met him in his apartment. We went out for lunch. He had a normal, he was a normal person. He was my idol, but he was also a normal person who wanted to talk about his health problems and who I had nothing to say to. And it was tremendously liberating because I realized I don't have to be him. I don't have to be, I have to just write however I can write because I'm so different from him. I mean, how am I going to try to emulate this completely different person? And also, um, the person who was a writer is very different from the writing. So there are many, many writers I admire very, very much, and I'm sure many of them I could have amazing conversations with if I weren't so nervous when I met them. But, um, but I don't quite think about it that way, that I, that I would love to meet them. I mean, I, you know, I, I can think of a lot of living writers, you know, Ian McEwen, uh, J.M. Coetzee, Toni Morrison, as I said, Garcia Marquez. I think they're all incredible, um, brilliant writers. But I don't necessarily know if, you know, I might be better off. I know, I don't think I'd be disappointed. I, what? I don't know that I would be disappointed. I think that my, what I can really gain from them most is reading their work and studying their work. I think that's their gift. Okay. I wasn't disappointed with John Ashworth. I just want to make that clear. I wasn't disappointed. I was tongue tied. I think you want to meet him again. I might. I would love to meet him again. Absolutely. And not be so nervous. Well, to pick back on that, have you ever met someone that was a first? Was there a big fan of yours and they got tongue tied? Did you consciously try to put them at ease and build on that experience? Um, I think I do make an effort, if as much as I can, to put people at ease when they talk to me about my work. But um, I can't think of a specific moment when that ever happened. I think also he tried to put me at my ease, but I was just too scared. It was a long time ago, and he was my idol. You know, it's like when they um, when they show somebody, you know, a big fan meeting a rock star. You know, just what can you say? So I'm a future reader. I have yet to read your work, but it sounds like you have like pairings in your protagonist. Mm -hmm. like, how do you juggle that if that is the case? Like, do you find that to be kind of mind-boggling sometimes? Well, this was a hard book to keep in my head. There are a lot of different stories, and it was not um, it was not an easy one to write. But as I said before, I don't want to give it away because it's part of the mystery of the book. But they are all connected. So in that sense, it wasn't so different. I mean, I knew what I was going for. But um, it did take a while to figure out the structure of the book and the kind of circular, nonlinear shiftings back and forth. And, and by pairings, do you mean, you mean in time periods, there are these different? With the Amelia Earhart book, uh, you were talking about her and the navigator. Yes. And then it was like, well, yes, there are a lot of relationships. I mean, the books, they're very um, emotional. And they're very much about people connecting. I mean, I, I can enjoy books that are very ironic and very distant, and I can admire them enormously. But that's not where I live. I mean, I really write um, about people trying to make connections. It's a very, there's a lot of, a lot of people communicating in various ways. That's really what the book is about. Thank you so much.